via Zoom, so at least you can see me. Um, so I'm so pleased to be here. Um, again, I'm Tabitha Stadler. I'm the Director of Environmental Protection in the Caribbean. We go by our acronym EPIC, and um, if you want to learn more, epicislands.org. Epic Islands is our handle. Um, and so conservation strategies at the human-bird interface is the topic today. Uh, let's see if I can get my not moving. And I have three parts introduction section. I'm going to talk here about the Black Cat Petrel Conservation Program in Haiti and the Grenadine Seabird Program. And um, you can see Haiti in the Greater Antilles. And this is the um, transboundary nation of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Grenada of the second program. Um, so there's a lot to cover. I'm, I'm going to talk sort of fast and do my best. Oh, you know, I was going to start my timer and I started a little late. So I'm not sure um, if that will help me or not. I have a timer. Um, so first, yeah, but, I don't know. Wave at me you know, or something. Um, so first a little bit, a tiny bit about EPIC. We're excited to be celebrating 20 years of conservation as a nonprofit. And as a result, we did some strategic planning and we realized that we have these three values that we think have made us really successful in that human bird interface in that place um, where we are trying to change conservation behaviors. Um, and so very quickly, um, just we do work throughout the Caribbean, but conservation is a very local thing. And so you're gonna see us really, really zooming down into specific conservation issues in the two case studies. We're very people and community focused and, and so much so that if you look at our logo in the upper left here, like we're thinking of adding people to our logo because we realize as you look at our programs, so much more about people because people are really where the conservation issues are, um, not necessarily um, in the nature piece. And then leadership was when we really realized um, that we invest a lot in leaders, that everybody, we really believe that everybody is a leader, whether you're just leading your family or a club or community. And uh, so that capacity building, I think, has been a successful part of what you're going to see um, moving forward. And so I'm not an ornithologist, and I'll talk about two programs um, involved with our team, but my background of 30 years is in conservation behavior change. So I wanted to do a slide on this because I think this is something I bring from my experience to the table to think about. Um, so when I started in environmental education 30 years ago, we would canoe instead of kayak. Um, we had a very linear way of thinking of things. I called this the old way, where we thought, you know, if you tell people it's an issue and you give them some knowledge about why it matters and you know, a little hard in there, that they will take and make a pro-environmental decision. And now with the rise of social science podcasts and um, so much more we know about how people learn and why they make decisions, here's the new way. This is the new mental model, right? Um, people um, and decision making are far more complex. There's a lot of different drivers from money or convenience, you know, like um, I didn't recycle because there wasn't a recycling bin there. There's a, an access issue. Or sometimes it's very emotional, you know, like, um, my friend said that it was a good idea, so that's why I'm recycling, but you might have the flip side where, well, somebody I don't like said it was a good idea, so I avoid it. Um, so thinking, um, my first point here is just realizing that, you know, we had a more linear way, we're really learning a lot more about social science, and I don't always see, after working in a lot of regional programs, I've done some um, surveys of elected officials across regions, um, watershed decision-making studies, lots of things like that. And there are all these tools out there, the surveys, the focus groups, the interviews. And even when people are doing this, they're not necessarily documenting their observations and publishing them. And I think that that's an important contribution to consider as we move into it. And one of the trainings I took early in my career that I really liked is this CBSM, community-based social marketing. You might want to uh, check that out. Um, and that we should be investing in studying the people in the same way that we study the species. And it takes both sides of that to really drive behavior change. And let's face it, we need large scale behavior change on this planet if we're going to really reverse, reverse the tide. Um, so case study here. Let me look uh, at my time. Um, so the first one is a really neat program on the endangered black cat petrel seabird, which is a fascinating um, kind of a medium-sized bird that li bird lives most of its life offshore. Um, when it does fly to land in the, in the winter uh, to the tops of Caribbean mountains, specifically the only known nesting site is Hispaniola. Um, makes this little woo -woo 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 sound um, and it's an endangered species. Um, so uh, the story that we like to tell from EPIC is this team of international researchers went to Hispaniola to try to find this nesting site that they did find in 2012. Um, and here's a little neat research piece. Um, our 
one of our co-founders pictured here, Adam Brown, introduced this use of marine radar and they park the truck at the top of the mountain when the sun sets, we know the birds are gonna come in if they're there and they see them on the radar screen and if the, the size and the speed of that target appears to be petrol-like and there's enough of them and they may have to move the dish a couple times, they will locate a, a slope to investigate in the daytime and look in the burrows um, for petrels nest eggs. And on this day, when they discovered them in 2012, you know, they just, they just turned to look and right there, there were people farming right on the slopes, right near um, the petrel colony. And so this is the complex program that was born of that. All of the amazing partners, I mean, Epic is just one piece of a huge group of folks that have been doing this for many years. And a brief uh, look at that is um, the sustainable farming program. So you may know that Haiti has um, issues with erosion and poverty, um, and, and there's um, some unsustainable farming practices. So a key part of the program are these village savings groups. We have a, a, a picture here in the upper left. Um, and they sign a pledge, make a commitment, and they get intensive training, they save money, they make capital improvements, and they implement the whole program with, with support um, from, from knowledgeable people. And here's some of the work that these 400 families and 2,500 people did, which is soil conservation, controlling gullies and erosion barriers, collecting water, um, building cisterns and collecting water, lots of things to improve, improve crop yield. So here we are, we're looking at this sort of win-win, solving the people problem releases the pressure on the petrels. And sometimes if you're looking at a conservation issue, you know, turn it on its end and think of the people uh, side of it first. Um, this is restoring habitat from planting trees and the tree nursery. Um, the second part is pretty traditional uh, school-based programs, but thinking about, you know, generational cycles. The students are the future farmers and they learn all the same thing as the adults. So the adults teach the kids, the kids teach the adults. Um, and um, the, the third part of the program, um, I'm sorry, this is still in the education pride, but this is a little bit more um, different, is a pride campaign of a, um, an annual festival that includes um, the soccer team playing, um, a parade, music, and all that. And then the, here's the mascot on there of the petrol, um, bringing artwork into the community. And here's an example of the use of change makers and leadership. The soccer team is highly respected. The community gathers to watch the soccer matches. And um, here's the, the patch that goes on the uniforms. The conservation team has sponsored um, the soccer team to get the word out. And then finally on this one, an, an interesting thing has been we've used films. So if you're interested in seeing the films about that program, you can see it on the Epic Islands on YouTube. We have a playlist with all of them. And they started very traditionally, like a documentary to show funders with the British narrator and everything. And um, what, we, what we decided at I mean, the third one, the team basically started making the films in Haitian Creole for Haiti. Sorry, Tabitha, could you unmute yourself? please. That was just your eight minutes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, did you miss some of that? Yeah, sorry, but just continue. Okay, well, anyway, I just want to mention the films piece is really interesting um, because now the films are made in Haitian Creole for Haitians. And, and this idea that the the work that they're doing as leaders in their community is really being featured and it's providing like a permanent and kind of durable commitment to that leadership and inspiring others. And it's been a tough part of the program to fund. It's not our traditional funding scheme, but I think it's been a really interesting way to kind of get that word out. Um, so now my computer isn't moving. All right, so here's a little bit on the research and monitoring, not so much the focus of this, um, but you can see the sub colonies, the type of work being done. Well, we do work the trail cameras, identifying threats. This has been able to go on during COVID, um, but I have to say that we did get word that um, people moving from the city to get away from the COVID and the, the crowding are taking up farming. And there has been some clearing in this area where we're you know, doing this intensive um, education, pride, and monitoring program right next to the petrol uh, nesting colony. So that's not good news. Um, I only have about a, a brief time on this one, but I do want to mention it's a similar example of this human bird interface. And it started with the publication of the seabird breeding atlas in 2010. Um, 
there were uh, data was gathered from out the Lesser Antilles, but there were about 200 islands that still needed to be surveyed. And what we found in that was sort of twofold. The um, environmental significance here of the Grenadines as three sites of global importance, 18 regional importance, um, but also um, the threats, including poaching, is a big threat there. So the real focus there is to increase the value of seabirds and decrease poaching. And you can see the results of the initial harvest survey here. 47% said they ate seabirds, 67% eat seabird eggs. And so this program has a similar tenor of really a multi-generational education, broad stuff on that public and individual targeted things, including a lot with leadership and stakeholders. Uh, a volunteer patrol, although actually they're not volunteer, we do compensate them. Again, another economic um, uh, motivation so that somebody going out to do an eco tour or uh, fisher folk can also do the monitoring. And they have seemed to deter poaching, which has seemed to increase now during COVID with less people out and about. Um, but almost 70 folks have been involved in that. Um, and again, that's that leadership base who tells their friends. And the final piece here is just, we do have a conservation management plan full of the science, but um, also full of the information um, from the harvest study. We will repeat that study um, at the end of this in about a year, early next year. Um, and we're gathering that stakeholder group together to try to look at ways to implement it. So I really wanted to share just some threads of observations through um, you know, community involvement, the commitment, prioritizing threats, using the surveys, studying the people as much as the species, and that active involvement of leadership and change makers. Um, so that is my very brief overview of two programs. I put my email on there, director at epicislands.org, and I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me.